my job today is to make sure that you talk, I as a seasoned person, not old person, but seasoned person, deliver to you a lot of experiences through the storytellings and to understand how the food supply really works because there's a lot of miscommunication and misunderstandings in the world about supply chain in the food industry and how everyone needs to be involved, not be taken out, but actually be brought to the table. So you um, mentioned, we were mentioned that there are two of, three of us leading the company, uh, there are more than us, but they ha I have two brothers that are the smartest ones in the family. And um, we were brought up by parents that own schools and universities in Bogota, Colombia. There were social entrepreneurs before there was such thing as social entrepreneurship. They educated, uh, my father uh, built, they created the first evening school for working people. People who drove the truck, who cleaned the house, and needed to get a diploma, a high school diploma in, in the evening. And so he was brought by two other professors um, from a city called Medellin, Colombia, into Bogota to create that first school and the first universities for evening um, students that couldn't study during the day because they had to make a living. And that's how my first job was ringing the bell, stamping the books. My brother set up the first little computer systems in the schools. Everyone was involved in the business of helping society while making a living. And everybody, as he, they brought us up, showed us that everyone in that school system, from the lady who served the coffee, which we call Tintos, the little coffee sh uh, person with one hand only. She had only one hand, but she was serving the coffees throughout the school, had a reason to be on that supply chain of education. And that's how we grew up. We grew up understanding that everybody had a reason for it. It's the hand, the hand that works the farms, the hands that codes the computers, is the coding lines, and is the lines that feed us all in the farms. That was the meaning of that logo, and that was what's so important, and that very few have understood. Now people are starting to understand it a little bit more. So with that, we start the story, right. and we start with, I hope I can do this right. Oh no, this is good. Okay, so let me see, because I don't have the screen here, so I have to go here to make sure I don't make mistakes. So from farm to table. So you have the little strawberries, and I brought strawberries because in the supermarket industry, uh, when you walk into the supermarket thing, you always see the produce. It's the first thing you saw, see, because it's how we appeal to the consumer, freshness. And reds, bell peppers, strawberries, apples, those colors attract you more to spend more. Okay, so that's important. That's why I start with the strawberries. And yes, I have been doing strawberries for the last 30 years, whether it's processed, frozen, or fresh. So from farm to table. So we're going to do today uh, how data and AI is going to really impact our system. And there's the whole chap GPT and the AIs of the world. But I want to make sure we set the stage for all of you to understand a little bit better how supply chain works so then when you add technology on top of it, you have the real foundations of what you're doing. And so the world supply chain of agriculture is so complex that today, oops, now we go back here, yep, that today we're wasting 62,500 truckloads per day of food from farms to distribution centers. So think about it. We produce them, but we never even leave the farm or they leave the farm and get rejected. Yeah. In the United States, around 4,900. So when you see those trucks up and down the freeways, 4,900 of those are not going to be able even to make it to distribution centers, or they will make it to distribution centers, and you will see that they get rejected. And people don't understand why. People think rejection is because of quality, and it has nothing so, to do sometimes with quality. Or people, or farmers don't even harvest. Let it die. Let it not even harvest it, because it's going to be more expensive for a farmer to harvest, to put it in a box, to put it in a truck, to send it to a market that is going to pay nothing. So it's even better to just let it die. 
So that is the dynamic of the industry that you're going to be learning today uh, to understand how you might be able to help us impact this positively. So the food supply chain is one line that has many, many players in it. And again, I will insist there's a reason for it. Because the new generations are trying to say, let's take it from farm directly to the house. But there's a reason why that's not 100% possible. Some of it, yes, but not all of it. You have a packing house. Every single fruit and vegetable that we consume has to go through a packing house, a processing plant. The oranges have to be washed to be put in a box. The strawberries have to be br brought into from the, sto from the harvesting area to a place to cool them down so they can be transported and so on and so forth. And the suppliers also, the suppliers that have to exist because they're the ones who deliver to the big chains or the big contracts. So we need them to be able to aggregate smaller farmers to supply. Um, or the distributors downtown LA, where some of the product might not be having a house, no, cannot find them, can find a, a buyer, though we land into the distributors who sub-distribute to even the little guy who has a little card in the store, in the street, selling mangoes in the, in the, in the street. Or brokers and agents, for example, there's a type of broker in this country that has to deal with all the paperwork of trade agreements that exist among the countries. And you need that person to keep up with those paperwork to be able to make sure that the product flows. And that's a job by itself. Or the logistics, when you have the little truck, the medium truck, the large truck, that needs to be continuously deciding where to move the inventories. And obviously the retailers. And I left last the farmer because, oops, did I put it right? Um, yeah, so the, the lines are there. The farmer, there's a misconception that smaller farmers are the ones who deliver to our stores. When you see the brand, like the Del Montes, the Dolls, the Driscolls, they aggregate farmers underneath them. Very few large corporations own their own land. They have to have a lot of little farmers, sometimes 1,000, sometimes 12,000, sometimes 20,000 farmers across the world that they aggregate. So they need the farmers. And the farmers that you see on the pictures or in the movies, the little farmer, that farmer depends on a larger farmer that is an aggregator to the big companies. And there is a reason for it, because the little farmer can only provide certain times of the year, like the same Oxnard, California, only you can supply from January through May, and then that's it. The crop is done because the season in that region is done. So now we move to Santa Maria, and then that's only from May till July, and then Salinas from July through October, and then the sun starts going down because we go winter, so we move back down to Mexico. So there's a reason why one company cannot own all the land in the food supply chain. They need different aggregators. So that's not only for the fruit and vegetables, which is one of my specialties, but for everything, whether it's milk, whether it's the pigs, whether it's the bread, the wheat, and so on, and even the ingredients. Um, having ing a vanilla from Madagascar is not only one place. You need different regions to be able that if something goes in Madagascar, we have a second region producing those ingredients or that vanilla so we don't lose the supply for it. So the thinking is that supply chain is linear. That moves the way that I was mentioning, the farmer, the distributor, the broker, and so on and so forth. That's what the whole world thinks. And when COVID-19 hit, everybody thought, oh, I'm going to find a lot of solutions to streamline production, to make things better, to account better to where the products move when to when. And yes, we 100% needed that because we were wasting so much in between from the time that the distributor, the distribution received the product till the time that it was sent to the uh, packing house, I mean, sorry, to the consumer or to the front store or to the uh, manufacturing to produce salads. A lot of inefficiencies. And those inefficiencies, we were putting them under the rug as a loss of business. Um, so we needed that. But what everybody was missing and still missing is that it is not linear. Supply chain is more like this. I'm the farmer, 
I'm the shipper or I'm the buyer. And I think need to understand where is, what's my FOB price of my product? I need to understand where's the volume coming from, many regions. I need to understand what's the, how is the weather happening in the different regions. I need to know how the terminal markets are happening because maybe uh, New York is pulling more product. Maybe, um, literally I leave this, one large fast food company decided to produce strawberry banana shakes and literally shook the whole industry because it took all the strawberries and all of a sudden we didn't have fresh strawberries. So even that, the holidays, believe it or not, those are so crucial. Why? Because you're shipping, growing, running around, and you forgot that, hey, there is a Guadalupe Day in Mexico and the border is closed. There's no product coming in. Or like I leave myself when I was shipping a one truck uh, vessel, con a full vessel of bananas from Ecuador to St. Petersburg, all of a sudden the holiday on a Friday, that is a, a, a holiday of some kind in the country, they will, our workers will go drinking until Monday. <laughs> then I had to move always the vessel to Wednesday or Thursday because I couldn't have the workers, right? Things of that nature. Uh, and then <laughs> comes the famous theory that we have come, which are 76 variables that continuously are moving targets to be able to have product on your, in, in your system. So, here is the deal. Imagine you wake up in the morning, you're ready to go to class, and you have no idea if it's raining or not. You look at your phone and it doesn't work. It just doesn't do anything. So you don't know how you're going to dress. You don't know what class do you have. You know more or less because yesterday I had math, so most likely I have whatever else today. That's how it would happen if you had no phone. But guess what? That is the life of a farmer. The farmer is continuously risking and hedging. Wakes up in the morning, they plant it. Yes, they did say five acres, 100 acres, 5,000 acres, whatever your acreage is, because last year I did this. But I wake up in the morning, I'm driving my truck, and I have no idea if I'm going to be able to deliver or supply or sell everything that I'm producing today. I have an estimate, but I'm not sure. So I have to start, the farmer start calling many people. They called somebody in the terminal who has a friend. They called somebody in another region who has another plant. They start calling everywhere, and everybody has a different version of the story. Everybody tells them differently because um, if any one of you ever sit in a farm area, there's always the coffee shop. At the coffee shop is where all the farmers wake up early in the morning and stop by for the coffee or the, or the breakfast, and then they start talking about what's going on in the industry. And depending on who you're talking, you tell one farmer, how you doing? And he say, oh, it's really bad today. And guess what? He's selling at top price, but he doesn't want his neighbor to know because he might be called by the friend to take his product. Or I'm doing really great because they don't want to tell them that they're not doing great. So there's a lot of talk and not real data on the system. So that's the reality of a farmer, but it's also of the packing houses. It's also the reality of the shipping lines. Today I had an amazing meeting mm -hmm. with the largest supply, cold supply chain in the, in the world, literally, that does all the thermostats for all the comp companies. They also don't have the data. The trucking companies, they are guessing based on what they hear and what last year happened, where to send the trucks. Again, no data. More important than anybody, the buyers don't have the real-time data. And that's where everything starts. Imagine a buyer who is a young, wonderful, entrepreneurial thinker that has now the ability to do contracts. And they don't know what's going on in the farming area. They don't know what's going on in the ground. They just deliver those contracts, and every single supplier and farmer just runs for their life to deliver and all the mishappenings start happening. So again, buyers are crucial to have the data and they don't have it. So you get the picture. The picture is like, whoa, there's no data. Data at the starting point of where farming starts. Can you imagine buyers calling farmers to ask them for data? And the farmers are calling each other for data. And the data of the data is who knows data of what? There's no data, right? And so that's how the decision make, 
making has happened for the last um, several year, decades now. And so as you see, that supply chain is broken. So that origin, give you an example. Um, and it's ha it happened actually two years ago. Um, ma um, lemons, the yellow lemons, are being shipped in the winter from Chile in, in Argentina into the United States. But what happened two years ago was that South Africa had a bumper crop. That means heavy, the heat came and a lot of uh, uh, lemons came up on the trees. So they sent to the market cheap boxes of lemon. So while the Argentinians had lemons to send to the United States, the South Africans were sending lemons to the United States at half the cost. And the Argentinians started losing money. So they stopped, as you see in the picture, harvesting. That's it. It's more expensive to ship it because by the time they get here, nobody's going to want to buy them because the buyers have already offers from South Africa at less price. So why would I buy a box at $10 when South Africa is offering it to me at $5? A buyer who has profit and loss statements has to stop and say, Dup, that's it. So Argentina stops. That's two years ago. So last year, farmers say, well, well, maybe this is not a good place to do business. We're going to stop doing as many lemons for fresh, and we're going to go into juice. Why is that? Because it's less expensive. You don't have to put boxes. You don't have the labor is completely different. You just take those lemons and send them to the juice manufacturing companies, and now you have or a lemon juice concentrate. So this year, your lemons are going to be more, more expensive, because South Africa now is producing the normal crop, and Argentina is not producing enough. So when you go to buy your lemon, remember me. <laughs> expensive, okay? <laughs> That's a type of story that you see. So now let me give you another type of case. And this is one that we did because of sustainability. I knew this when I used to sit down with my farmers, let's say in asparagus in Peru. So we'll sit down and I will go over every single expense they had per box. Not only the, the box, the cost of the box, the cost of the cooling, the cost of the ribbon around the, the, the asparagus, the cost of the guy driving the truck from the asparagus to the cooler house. All that is the cost of that box. Let's say it was five, seven dollars. Perfect. Now we knew our cost. Now we knew how much minimum to sell it, not to lose money. Even the cost of, of banking, because they get loans. Then you send that uh, to the market, and you have to make profit. So because we had that, we, I have understood all along that it's not only the cost to the farmer, but let's analyze the cost to earth. Because every time that that box is going to be thrown away, it's not only the food that we see wasted, that we saw in the picture before, it is the earth cost that we just had. And I'll explain to you how that goes. Here's a tomato. And this happened four weeks ago in Sinaloa, Mexico, which is one of the largest producers of tomatoes for anything. Your pizza, your fresh, your can, your salsas, you name it. That is kind of the, the, the region, Los Mochis, is the number one kind of region of tomatoes. And it's the off season of the United States when Fresno is producing, Mexico is producing. But Plant City, California, all of a sudden had a lot of tomatoes grown and the market was saturated. So what did they do? They just start throwing them away, literally throwing them away. Not only that, they were even giving them away. Uh, one of our team members that worked there, she was getting boxes and boxes for free, just take it, because nobody would buy it. Well, that box means that when you waste one truckload of that, con of that container of tomatoes, you have 101 subcategories from the fertilizers, the water, the boxes that now we're throwing away, because the boxes are thrown away now, um, the canisters, the water that we run to, to, to clean the tomatoes. So you start analyzing the amount of numbers that we have, and all of a sudden, in our last report, we can actually give water to 245,000 people in one container of tomatoes that we just throw away on water. It's amazing the amount of food waste that we're doing because of the market dynamics. Who is impacting 
So you see all the different industries, but who are we impacting? We're impacting 23 industries. Because supply chain is not just the farmer and the buyer and the distributor, it's also the input industry, the fertilizer companies, the boxing companies, the processing plants, um, the banks who give loans, the insurance companies who provide the insurances and so on and so forth. So we have all these industries that are going, that are getting impacted across the supply chain. So when you're thinking supply chain, don't think just the food itself, think the other industries that are impacted by that supply chain. And so whether it's the marketing side of it, whether it's the financial side of it, whether it's the insurance side of it, believe me, those are even packaging, which is one of the biggest things that the industry started working, I would say 10 years ago, when they decided how do we make better packaging. Driscoll right now came with an, an amazing box that is, um, you can box the strawberries, but also you can, um, it's good for earth. So you can throw it away in, in, in your ground, in your uh, backyard, and it's nutrient for the, for the industry. It took a while, but it's coming. So even packaging is another industry within the uh, supply chain. So we still have very important item here to discuss because I want to make sure that you will walk out of here not thinking that we can replace the most important people here, the farmer and the buyer. You can't, not yet, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, but not yet because of the dynamic of the industry. It moves too fast to have algorithms think for them yet because we're still dealing with earth with, uh, with uh, nature, with uh, microclimate changes. And uh, let me tell you one thing, when I started this industry, I used to plan a mango program in Peru, I don't know, two years in advance. And we did the whole planning, the whole financial, we get the numbers, we get the investors in Beverly Hills, and I forget, we bring all the, the, the boxes, the elements, and we would ship, and program was good. Because climate change was not there as a, part of the issue. Yeah, we had kind of some bumps on the road, couple things here and there, but never like today. Today there's no way, and you can hear that throughout the industry, I am lost. I don't know what is going to happen next month, next week, next day. Um, it used to be said in our industry that never a dull day, every single day in this industry. Now it's never a dull minute, I hear that. It's crucial. And it looks like a madhouse in a, like a, think about the Wall Street floor in our industry, but from 3 a.m. till 6 a.m., everybody's running, 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 running. Again, brains here thinking. So any solutions that you can come up with for the human beings, at least for the next five to 10 years, please think about it. Don't think about the product and the supply chain and the sustainability just from the product itself or just from the farm itself. Think that they're human beings making a lot of decisions here. So let me tell you about pineapples, for example. Pineapples, as you see, when you walk into your store, and I tell this to many people, walk into your produce department and pick up every single item, and I can bet you my life that there's not even one or two from the same country. You have different countries from many places. Your pineapples from here, your pitayas from there, your potatoes from here, your strawberries from there, because our food supply chain has said that we want to eat strawberries all year round. We want to have avocado, tostado, avocado every single day of our lives. And therefore we have to supply. Well, guess what? That created this need to source from all over the world. So the day that we stop having avocado every single day of our days, tostado, avocado, then maybe the, the world will start changing. If we can start eating what we produce locally, then might change. But I don't see it yet because we, we like our strawberries in our cereal. We like our blueberries in our whatever. Uh, we like our smoothies. We can change that. And now the, 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 the um, jars of this and the bowls of that, um, one of the biggest one growing is pitaya uh, because of the bowls, the, the, the healthy bowls. So because of that, look at how pineapples move around the world. But more like look about how blueberries move around the world. Those blueberries from even different states, taken from Oregon down all the way to Detroit, taken from Detroit all the way down to up to Oregon. I mean, it's continuously crossing depending on productions. 
because Oregon sometimes is winter, Detroit is less winter. Then we go to Mexico and it's definitely not winter. And so all, everything starts moving up and down all over the place. So when you talk and look at supply chain, as long as we have consumers consuming every year what they want to consume, we still will have this. And therefore, let's work with that for now until we start moving into a generation that will start consuming more locally. So remember when we're talking about the famous, how the brain has to think, I have to pick up in the phone, I have to call people, I have to find out if somebody's doing this, I have to figure out if somebody has the product, if the market is not uh, doing good in New York or whatever that is. We need then to remember that there are 76 variables that impact our supply chain. I say that based on the TRIS theory, which is by a famous scientist from Russia. Uh, it was a same, uh, a same scientist at the same time of uh, Mr. Einstein working in the patents office, and they, he said every invention has X amount of variables and don't move from there. That's what it is. Well, we went and researched all the variables. Here they are, 76. Remember I mentioned a holiday? Holiday is crucial. People don't think about it, but it's crucial. And I have seen that, oh, I'm going to order strawberries in, um, I don't know, for Thanksgiving time, and I'm going to have them shipped to me five days before versus 10 days before, or even before seven days before. Seven days before, $2,500 a truck. Five days before, $10,000 a truck. Same distance. Guess who pays for that difference of pricing? The farmer. So we have to be attentive to this cost because it's not only what the customer already wants a certain price. You, the consumer, wants to pay only so much for that strawberry. And the minute that that strawberry goes up or that uh, potato goes up, you stop buying. So we have to, the, the supermarkets, the processed foods, they have to keep cost at a certain level and therefore it pushes back the, the supply chain. And who is the one at the last end of that is the farmer. So let me explain that. When a farmer uh, ships the product, which is consignment, let me repeat that, consignment. That means I will sell this to a company, but until they get the product and they accept the product, they don't accept paying me. If they don't accept the product, they don't pay me as a farmer dangerous business. Now you wonder why we don't have as many farmers or why we're losing farmers. It's not a good business at one point. It's like, whoa, I'm, I go and get a loan, I, I farm, I kill myself here day in, day out, I work seven days a week, I send the product, it gets rejected, I just lost money because everybody gets paid. The trucking company wants to get paid, the box gets paid, the cooler gets paid, everybody gets paid, and instead of me making seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000 profit in the truck, uh, on this one delivery, I'm actually losing money and having to pay more for it. So think about the economy of that, and I don't know whether that will change or not. I don't know, but think the other way around. As a consumer, would you buy a tomato if you haven't seen the tomato? Starting to be that, a little bit on the delivery of the, of the meals that we're ordering, we're starting to appreciate getting the tomatoes, but I'm telling you, the quality control to deliver you that tomato is that they throw away other tomatoes to make sure that that tomato that arrived to you, it looks beautiful. Okay, if it doesn't look beautiful, you're not going to like it. Same thing here. Remember when you used to go, maybe you didn't, but with your moms or your grandmas, you go to the supermarket and you look at it, you move it, you, you oh yeah, this is good, I'm going to take the ones that I like. Same thing in our, as a macro industry. Until that truck arrives and it's in good condition, nobody gets paid, okay? So we're talking about the variables that exist, and so it is impacting the logistics, it's impacting the even scientists. I have to tell you this beautiful story. So uh, I'm in the middle of a program doing stories, and I keep going to stories because stories have been in my life for, for a long time. Um, and I go to uh, one scientist who's de developing the latest seed or variety of strawberries that is going to produce more strawberries per acre than what we have. So the famous Albion variety produces 5,000 cases per acre. And he's de developing the Monterey variety who's going to produce 
10,000 boxes per acre, which is great. That sounds amazing because now we're going to feed more people with less land. But guess what? The variety is going to produce more when everybody's going to be producing more. So when there's too much in the market, what happens? Exactly. Prices go down, the market goes down, and that was, a, that was, I remember thinking that three years or four years prior for the deployment of the variety, and, and I asked the scientists, and I said, well, why do you, del but that's going to be horrible because everybody's going to have a lot of strawberries, and this during the summertime, listen to this thinking process, is during the summertime when the valley, in Cali for those who don't live here, Central Coast is where the strawberries are produced, Central Valley, which is in Fresno areas where the, fr the stone fruits, the apricots, the peaches, they come up. And so during summertime, the stores move back the strawberries and they put the summer fruit in the front because they're coming out. But guess what? All of a sudden you have all this amount of strawberries and less space on the shelves and more of the stone fruit in the front. So sure enough, we lost three of the biggest shippers that year because there was no market, so it was zero market, so they just let it die and they lost money. So even scientists need to understand markets to develop when they're developing. Um, we have also the packing houses, we have the logistics, we have the buyers, and so on and so forth. Everybody needs to have the data. So how do we optimize those decisions and how we start making this better? So let's start with the most important thing, which is data. Anything data, whether it's the farm data, whether it's the tracking data, data. Data is definitely our, the beginning of everything. We go with, we have to find the data. Huh, be careful about that. Because data is misleading. And I mean that sincerely. You have to, any time that you get data, please ask twice, three times, where's the data coming from? because there's a lot of data out there that is not really accurate data. And that will set you up for many failures in the future. But more important, if it's in the food supply chain, remember who's the most important person in a supply chain is our farmer. So anything we do is going to impact down to a farmer. So be careful about that data. Then you have to ingest that data. So you, now that you have the data, you're going to bring it in and you're going to now clean it. Um, metric tons rations are different than metric tons USA, period. So be careful. Then what are, let's, let's make sure we clean that data. We organize it. Make sure that when you get that data, you organize that data. You curate. Oh, this is an interesting story I have for you too. I learned this word, I, though it's a word that is used in data, but I learned from the lady who was the curator for the museum of the Walton family of the Walmart family. And I used to travel there a lot. And I stay in the inn and in the place where um, uh, the bed and breakfast were used to be owned by one of the, the houses owned by one of the Walton family. And so the lady who was the curator stayed there. And she taught me literally every time that we had dinner because I would stay two, three, four days and she would be there. She taught me curation. How do you curate art? Well, it's the same thing. It's the art of curating any data. And if you could go and do some classes on curating, that is your future, too, to understand how you're going to curate your data. Um, and then audit it. We, in our company, every 15 seconds are auditing the data to make sure that it's accurate. And then we contextualize it, because data for a farmer is different than for the buyer. Same numbers, but different way of looking at it. And then we make it nice and simple. And now you have a data set. More important, what you have to have in your heart is a lot of curiosity. Remember when I keep saying, ask, ask, where's the data coming from? Curate the data right. Make sure you do that. Problem solving, crucial in this whole supply chain industry. You have to start, anal when, you, when you do your thinking process and you want to find your solution, make sure you find the problem, come back, couple times to make sure that you're solving it. You have to make sure you have a lot of persistence because we are just at the beginning. Remember, this is the last industry to be, di to be digitalized, to be computerized, to be anything because 
remember every time that they, you want to change in a farm they only have 30 to 40 years of their life to make changes and if they make a change that it will impact them three four years they cannot recuperate financially a farmer cannot recuperate so be careful be persistent with uh, them and more important have a lot of empathy i mean <laughs> I was yesterday with uh, uh, several of the people in the industry and say, oh, farmers are so stubborn, they are so tough. No, 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 no. If you are the one who have to go and get the loans, if you are the one who have to do the seven days a week farming, if you are the one who gets up at three in the morning, mm -hmm. believe me, you have to have a lot of empathy to understand them. And then you're able to now listen more to the need, even the buyers. I mean, our buyers are in a completely stress all the time because they need to make sure that you, they have the store full uh, so you guys don't complain, right? Um, last, what, four weeks ago, uh, Tesco in England didn't have enough vegetables and fruits and all that, and the, the, the customers were so mad because they could get only one lettuce per, per family. That is the stress that they have to live with. And now remember one thing. In the supermarket industry and in the food industry, the fresh is what brings people to the store. It's not the one that makes the most money. In fact, sometimes they don't make money. But it's the one who brings the people to buy the cereal and the toilet paper. So that's why that category is so crucial and so important. Sometimes one of my supermarkets, I remember visiting them one day, and even the people of the divisions didn't even know where their building was. Because they're like, like the NASA or the CIA of the, company, of the industry, they're like in a block that nobody can touch. Don't talk to the people in the fresh market because they know what they're doing. And if they don't know what they're doing, we don't know definitely what we're doing. So interesting to know that that's what happens in the industry. So make sure you create, like in our case, we created a very important mission, which is offer the most flexible and groundbreaking software architecture to impact worldwide supply chain. Oh, create your own mission. If you're walking this path, of sustainability, create your own mission. Why am I in this for? Why am I going to wake up every day to make a change or a difference in the world? And then create your own vision. This is what they tell you in business. But you have to create your own. I have my own personally because you have to do that to get up excited every morning to do that. And when you do that, you have the heart. And look, we even have a little cartoon there because I happen to be a cartoonist too, okay? So have fun. Involve all the backgrounds that you have, art, um, entertainment, animation, gaming. Make it fun so we, the people, the farmers, the buyers, kind of get fun into this. It, it's a very serious issue, but it is, it is existentially overwhelming. So make it fun. And, f and, and, and also the teams that are working on it, they'll appreciate you having fun with them. So you have um, the ingestion that we were discussing and all the way to the data science analytics, right? So there are a lot of stacks, what they call science, uh, technology stacks, and some of you might know this, but you have all these different stacks. So we talk about ingesting the data, but then you start adding all the elements of the data. I think I have, a, oops, I have them all. So the visualization, the graphics, the how to do it, uh, the data in, the content management. Yes, all that you are going to learn, but more important is the first four things that we talk about, empathy, about curiosity, about problem solving, that is crucial. And so when you do that, this is what we have. We have our tools. You see, now we can see the pineapples where they're coming at certain time of the year. And we can even see certain regions that have better pineapples than other regions. So here's what happened. 30 years ago when I started this industry, I was told I had to find sparagus or mangoes or potatoes. And we just kind of like, okay, this is the country, go to that country and do it. But we were not thinking, and I mean me too, that that region will run out of water because it was never meant to be for that. I'll give you an example. There is a region in, in Peru called Ica, I-C-A. And Ica is kind of a desert like California up here, they are very desertic. But the Andes, the water comes from the top of the mountains, come under the water, and we were pumping out the water. For what? For irrigation of the asparagus and the oranges and all this. Well, guess what is happening now? 
we don't have enough snow and the water that we pump out, we're unbalancing the ocean and the, f and the ecosystem of the ocean. And it's happening across different regions of Peru because we were not understanding at that point. Now we are all understanding that, oh, they want asparagus when we didn't have asparagus, but we shouldn't have done that. So now we're starting to put in our data where are the best regions to grow that naturally can grow products. There's a famous book called 1492, if you ever can read it. It's when Christopher Columbus landed in the Americas and what was indigenous to here. And that is, that's what it is. This plant is produced here, but cannot be produced there. It was this lady who created, um, she went to Africa with the Peace Corps and she discovered that um, as the tribes move around Africa, uh, when they get hungry uh, or the energy goes down, they have this little um, seed that they eat or chew and that keeps them going. And she thought, oh, that's interesting. So she started having it and she's, when she came back from uh, Africa, she went to uh, San Francisco and she created the first little bars that are for with that base. And um, uh, with that, she created a whole little industry and then the whole markets bought it and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden from having 20,000 bars to 200,000 bars, all of a sudden we need more raw product to produce the bars. But in Africa, those are grown wilderly in the wild. So now she had to find a place to farm that product so they could have more for the, for the uh, bars. So she went to Guatemala. Well, guess what? Guatemala is not Africa and it's not desertic. So the variety comes completely different. The flavor is different because it's not, it's not from, the na from that nature. Not only that, it's more costly to produce in the manufacturing side of it because you have to dehydrate it more. So you see, we end up creating things without thinking five, 10, 20 years ahead of what could potentially be damaging to our industry, to our earth. So ACTUS is that dashboard. Um, we are on six of our United Nations uh, um, places, um, um, points to take care of. And here you're going to see, I think it's going to be able to play, can I play? Just in case, how ACTUS move. So, it moves at a billion transactions per second and it's getting data from all over the world that now the buyers can see, okay, I want to see pineapples and who's bringing pineapples today, not the companies, but the countries, who is producing more pineapples, who is the weather patterns where, what is impacting what, and uh, um, there are 500 commodities here, we have the 76 variables, and we have all the weather patterns. Because the interesting thing about this um, whole industry is that every fruit and vegetable that you eat has different phenological phases. So let me repeat that, because on sustainability, you're going to have to start listening to this. Started from the University of Berlin long time ago, over 50 years ago, which is when a plant, when you plant a fruit or when the tree starts, uh, starts the production time, there's phenological phases that happen. Kind of like a, when a mommy had a baby on the tummy, there's nine months of gestation that the baby will come out healthy if she takes care of herself. So same thing here. We have the plant and at certain times of the year, of the, of the I'm sorry, of the phenological phase, you have to take care of that fruit, vegetable, pig, cattle, fish, shrimp, to make sure that they are properly delivered and managed. And that phenological phase, which is what we're starting to now finally starting to talk in the world, is going to impact how we manage our crops and how we grow our crops around the world. So keep an eye on that because that's an important element for you to guys, uh, for all of you to keep up. And so here I am, this is in here in uh, Central Coast. This is Alba Farms, is the organic farm for smaller farmers that take them and start growing them and graduate them to be farmers, only on organic. It's a wonderful gentleman who donated a major macro land and money to keep up with growing organic. That's why California is, one, is the leading organic in the world. Um, and the fact that we're celebrating 10 years of family farming. That is crucial too. And that's the attention that the United Nations is making sure that we pay 
too because 95 percent of our farms are family-owned farms in the United States, 80 percent worldwide. But let me give you another more interesting data behind that. Think about in your household who really has the last say so when buying something in the house. It's the mom, the wife, etc. In the farms, you always go to the farms and you see a guy driving the tractor, driving the this, but guess who is in the back office paying the payroll, getting the balance checkbook, making sure that there's money in the bank, and so on and so forth? Is the woman. Is the woman. And finally, after many years, we were able to get the United States to change one important thing, which was in the census, you always had in the farm census, in the rural census, or farm census, used to have um, who's the, how many, no, you have, who's the decision maker in the farm? Well, it was one box. Well, the guy, or the guy, because the wife was not going to put her name because it was, quote unquote, the guy. So we push and push, and we finally got it in the last census that we have two boxes. And guess what? It went from 100% it was a guy, somewhere around it was like 99% the guy, to now 30 or so percent, now woman and guy. And this year, which is the census, you're starting to see now even more. It's the woman who's making the financial decisions in the farms, period, in the world. So think also sustainability from that point of view, because it's the woman who's making all these, the guy's driving the truck, the guy's quote unquote the strong guy, but she's the one who's driving the family and the farming. So think about that in sustainability. That's the biggest sustainability item that I'm going to leave you with today and say thank you so much for allowing me to be here. <laughs>